Consequence Podcast Network. You know a hit when you hear it, but where did that hit come from? Where did this band come from? Who's the person that digs through the TikToks, the dive bars, the Spotify playlists day after day after day in search of the next great artist? Well, it's the A&R guy, artist and repertoire. So today, our guest is Mike Daly, the head of A&R for Hollywood Records, walking us through how to make a hit, how to make a hit, part one. On the What Podcast today, it starts right now. You're always trying to do your best. Voted most amazing podcast in the history of mankind. This is the What Podcast. Barry Quarter, Brad Steiner, Lord Taco along the way uh, throughout today. Oh, by the way, if you're a first time listener, thanks for joining us. If you've been around forever, welcome back. So uh, today, a very special day, Barry Quarter. We get to finally, finally pull the curtain back on some of the industry that we've never talked about before on the What Podcast, which bands this year that matter. Yeah, and that vote was unanimous too, by the way. Which was the vote? Best podcast ever. Yeah, by the way, what, what was the overall, you know, percentage, percentage you know, for or against? 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah. We gotcha. The actual numbers. Yeah, yeah. Do, we have, do we have, you know, breakdowns by district? We can get them, but they're 100%. Okay. Did we win the electoral <laughs> college as well? We won the electoral. We won okay. the recount. All okay. of them. And, oh, wow. Uh, like, with several judges cited. It was a, it was a, it was a sweep. Well, I still think it's fake. Uh, of course it is. I still think whatever you're saying is not real. Because if courts say it, if judges say it, it doesn't matter. They All right. So, so if you've, uh, by the way, let's step back for a second. If you are new to the show, I would uh, implore you to go back and listen to the Grace Potter interview that we did last week. I love this. And, and I very rarely, uh, Barry, you know this, I very rarely even know that the show exists after we do it. Yeah, right. I don't I don't go back and listen. I don't go when it's when things are done in my life, they're done. Like I just I'm that don't way with stories. I've never reread a story. Once yeah. I hit send to the editor, it's yours and I don't want to see it again. Ever. Even the ones you've written about me? Those I've reread only because you keep sending them to me. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something pretty special. I send your own articles back to you. Yeah, with so, made up names. This yeah. is the greatest article you've ever written. Brad's oh man, what if neighbor. I just start sending you articles <laughs> to you that were yours in in uh, quotation marks? Oh yeah, I remember this article. Remember this? You called me a uh, yeah son of a bitch. <laughs> so um, anyway. I uh, I went back and I actually listened to the Grace Potter chat, and it's not because you know I thought it was just such a a good episode she's just phenomenal on every fun? level she's just a great person yep. uh she's the, the she's just a good human and yep. i like listening to her i feel like we could hang out yep. um you know i kind of want to hang out with her in her vermont home uh i just kind of want to show up and be like hey i'm here grace and she would welcome you with yeah, open she, arms and do whatever she, you want to because she would have been making cookies or something she, you know she, she would she would have been making you're, cookies you're just right. in time yeah. You know, I've told you, uh, I've had like three or four interviews like that. Um, Warren Haynes, mm -hmm. um, Derek Trucks, uh, and Susan Tedeschi. I've talked to all three of them several times. And the last time I talked to all of them, Derek in particular, and I'm terrible name dropping. I get it. I know that. But I call, he answered and I was like, I have to say you three are the nicest people that I've interviewed over the years. I said, it always feels like I'm. I'm interrupting you doing the laundry or the dishes. Right. And he said, that's exactly what I'm doing. It's, it's what he was doing. Yeah. That's what well, when just, I was, you know, well, when I interviewed Prince, <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, that was, he's, he was doing the dishes. He's doing the dishes. I'm sure. You no. know, but you, you make a good point because um, I, I think about this a lot 
there's just some people that would be really, really, really good grandparents. Yeah. And I know that that sounds weird to say about a woman who's, uh, you know, got a, you know, newborn baby. She's going to be a great grandma. So, yeah. No, I, I, it, it means a lot to me. It sounds so trite and Southern and whatever, mm-hmm. but when people say he's a good guy, it means a lot. I don't say that. I don't throw that out there. Like uh, Barry, you're, this- you would be a great grandfather. You're going to be a great uh, grandfather. You're going to be a great granddad. You're going to be a fun grand grandpa. Yeah. Are you, wait, like by the way, so. are you grandpa? Are you poppy? Are you pop, grandpa pop? Barry? Grandpa Barry. Oh, grandpa Barry. But but can the kids actually get Barry out of their mouth or they just call you grandpa bear? Grandpa Barry. So, yeah, grandpa they're bear. the older ones. The younger ones, don't, they don't call me anything yet. Get out of the way. Wait, how old are the older ones? 35. Nine. We, have, oh, okay. we'll, we will have seven. Here in a little you will have seven grandkids in August when Grace oh has her. God. We will have seven. Yes. Oh my God! I know. I said I didn't that know. the other day. I, t- I mentioned that. Uh, by the way, during our weekend trip down with the little mini Roo, and I was like, you know, when you say that out loud, it becomes real, and it's pretty frightening. It's pretty weird. I mean, but, yeah. seven is a lot. Yeah. I mean, I don't have seven friends. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> what is it? I've always said you have two. One is you, and the other is fluid. Thank you. <laughs> That's me, Brad Steiner. Nice to meet you, LLC. Can I say one thing though? I'm glad you brought up going back. Um, And I want to make this correction because I think what we brag on ourselves is about, you know, about getting things right. But I saw a post on Facebook uh, from Mike Andy about our show with um, uh, about the Deftones, and he he was very very nice, and uh, but kind of took me really to task for making light of around the fur. And, and calling it a juvenile title and, you know, stop it. I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't caught up on it. Well, no, there's, and there's what podcast drama. Well, Have we created drama? drama. No, he was just super nice, but I wanted to make the correction and say, I saw your post and I, and I, I admit it. As I said on the show, I would, did not know Deftones. So I made a, tried to make a joke, you know, that a, around the fur sounded to me like something Van Halen would do with OU812 or, F, you know if you see k and turns out the song the title is it's it's a whole juxtaposition thing about the fur industry and meat and all that so i just wanted to admit i was wrong barry barry yeah. Yeah. barry don't don't do that i know you'd say if that. it That's was a joke it was a joke who cares and i just want to say we read this stuff and uh you know sometimes you make a joke and get it wrong i got it wrong well, so but the anyway. whole point of the joke is that you don't need to get it right it's just a joke yeah i know you're you making light me. about a funny uh, title who cares if it uh, t- t- stop it yeah. i've been doing this for 21 years and the amount of people who have um gotten a little bit sideways because of a joke i i can't even the list is just monumental yeah, and i'm not can... even gonna like you just don't you just move on and say what it was I... and who cares yeah. Fair enough. Oh, I agree. Dude. I just want to. We can't take things so seriously, guys. We can't take things so seriously. Ah, all right. So all right. excited dude, about but, this show. But do you feel better? Do you feel better now? I feel better. I, okay, yeah, good. I well, that's all live. that matters. I live. See, this is why Barry is a good person, and I am not. <laughs> Fair enough. I would be a terrible <laughs> grandfather. I would be a terrible. Pop-pop. Yeah. Yeah. Let it go. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> the the no, it is you know hey get a punch in the face look at that it's yeah. funny right get it up funny, it's funny. <laughs> get up it's funny <laughs> um so i uh i i had this idea when we first started expanding the podcast you know from the from the bonnaroo world last year before the covid thing hit because it's something we never really talked about and we love talking about parts of this industry that we don't really know. And it all started, if you're new to the show, it all started one day when, when Barry and I were walking backstage at Bonnaroo. And Bonnaroo is in the middle of a field in Tennessee. There's no electricity. They have to create an entire city, which becomes the fifth biggest city, sixth biggest city in the state of Tennessee every single year. They have to create it every right. time. They've got to whip it up like a tornado and drop it in the middle of a field in Tennessee. So Literally a 700-acre farm. So we were walking backstage one day and we're walking along the, 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 the road and I looked down to the, the ground and there are wires all the way down the road. And then eventually the wires get into PVC pipe. And then the more we were walking, the PVC just continued down the road. 
And it hit me at that moment. And I know this sounds so trite, but it hit me. Oh my God, they have to put down wires to yeah. run this thing. Who did that? Right. Who put those wires down? Who laid the PVC pipe? Who, you know, that there must be a million right. yards of just electric put, wire. And why they put it there and not over there. And Yeah. And so that's yeah. when it started hitting us like, oh my right. God, there's an entire industry that nobody seems to really talk about. And it's those guys, it's that kind of thing that we really, really enjoy. And I know it's nerdy uh, and I hope that you like it too. Um, some of you do, some of you don't, some of, us, some of you just want to listen and talk about bands and talk about, you know, stage plays. And that's cool too. But this kind of stuff, I really, really nerd out about. Maybe it's because of my industry. Maybe it's just because of, you know, I'm, I'm, I obsess over tiny yep. minutia and, and details like that. But either way, this was an idea that I had that I, that I wanted to bring to the team and say, Hey, how do you make a hit? Uh, do you know how you get the bands on the festival lineup. Um, not just a guy who's plucked them out of a live show and seen a live show and decides to put them on. No, there's a whole industry here of getting that artist on a, on a stage that also requires marketing, getting a radio hit, and before that, getting found to begin with. Dumb and who, who, yeah, who finds the band who establishes a career, who creates the hit, who then delivers the hit to the radio station, who delivers the marketing plan, who delivers the, the booking of the tour, on and on and on. So we've talked to booking agents before. That's a great episode if you want to get a little masterclass on how a tour is put together, especially a tour inside COVID. But today, we're going to start a two-part series on how you get a hit. How do you make a hit? And who makes the hit? So next week, we're going to talk to um, one of the, the most brilliant radio people in all the country. And I don't say that because the guy is my boss. He literally, I thought, about, I thought this about him before we started working together a year ago. And, and I'll think about it till the day I die. The guy just knows radio and knows, he's just got the best year in the country. His name's Troy Hansen. This week, though, we start from the granular level of where a band gets found. Yep. And then when that band gets found, how does that mature into an actual living breathing entity that can find its way onto a festival lineup yeah. so today the head of a and r for hollywood records mike daly is our is our guest on how to make a hit part one barry quarter do i get to talk i would love for you to talk if you'd like to <laughs> i wasn't sure you were gonna take a breath <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> that was originally the name of the show Brad takes a breath. <laughs> Do I get to talk? Do I get to talk? No, what I love about this as you were as you were talking, I was thinking most people get to see things from the top down. You only you read about the bands that made it. You know what I mean? They only make documentaries about the bands that made it and films and books and all that. So you you get to go back in time a lot in a lot of cases and they say you know we got discovered 20 years ago whatever sure what i what you and i and you talk about this a little bit with uh, mike and you've mentioned it with some other bands you know they come knocking on your door and want to play out in your little courtyard in your at your former radio station or their pr person sends me a press kit and i either choose to open it or not so we we have that unusual advantage of maybe sort of following bands from small to big um most people don't really number one and number two the question of why this band and not that band you know what i right. mean how yeah. many talented bands out there for whatever reason mm -hmm. didn't make it and to hear mike talk about and, and there are other examples but to hear him go to a show in an airport hangar to hear almost uh almost monday when they were basically saying please don't come to this show because we yeah. know it's not going to be good <laughs> yeah. and he said no i'm going <clears throat> and uh you know he's talented enough and experienced enough to realize the circumstances and to see that they had talent yeah you know that that to me is the standout moment that we're about to hear, but uh, those. Yeah. And, and, and you, you brought it full circle. The band that he, that, that at least where I found Mike was, 
when we interviewed my uh, almost Monday and almost Monday brought him up as being the guy that, that found them and gave them their shot. And it was that story that they told in an episode a few weeks ago about how he came to this airport hangar and a show that he didn't, they didn't want him to come to. And he, <laughs> he mentioned that in the, in the, in the thing. Now, the, the, the hard part about r and r is that, and I say this in the thing, and I try to lead him down this path, but it is the hardest job in all of the industry. Um, the pressure on these people is unlike anything that you have ever experienced. They have to deliver hits. And if yeah. they don't deliver hits, Yep. If you don't have a history of making hits, you don't get a job. If you can't find the next thing, if you are just the slightest bit behind yep. the next day in our guy, you're, you're yesterday's news. It is a pressure cooker. And, um, yep. you know, for a guy like me who, who, who fancies himself having a, a good ear and, you know, dreams of being an A&R guy one day, I could never do that job. I could never, you, you have to have a level of not just work ethic, but a uh, desire to, to beat everybody mm -hmm. that yeah. I just don't, I don't think I have. I don't think I have it. No, it's, it's fascinating. It's a special, it's a special group. It's fascinating to hear him, him describe what he does. Yeah. So, and I bring up the pressure part of it mainly because if you're watching this on YouTube, the man's sitting in front of an azalea plant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, He's just by his pool, you know. I love <laughs> that, seem, and I love. He doesn't I, seem pressured whatsoever. I love it when you bring that up because you don't know if he turns that camera even just a little bit. What we're looking at, you know. It oh could my be god, a parking lot. <laughs> it could be. A, it could be a Dollar General, uh, or it could be you know a million dollar pool. Yeah, Who it knows? Could, it could be his station wagon full of clothing or whatever. <laughs> With that being said, you so, know but... they 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 have a very hard job, but yeah. they make a lot of money. They make a lot. <laughs> the good ones, I imagine. That was the other thing. I, I love, uh, and you'll see, well, we can, I just love the confidence that he has in his abilities. I, I mean, he didn't say that, but you can, you can hear it in what he says. Um, he knows Boy, what he's if doing. you don't, if you don't have it, you better fake it, dude. Yeah. If you don't have it, you better fake it. Cause he they will, they will see right through you. You'll get eaten up and chewed out, chewed up and eaten live in a heartbeat. If, if you don't got it right. Yeah. It's great. He's right. good, another good interview. So this is Mike Daly from Hollywood Records on the What Podcast, which bands this year of that matter, which, by the way, what you're hearing in two seconds, the sweet, sweet study beats of Midist. Our uh, friend Nick Turner and uh, his band Midist have graciously given some of their brilliant work to us as uh, interludes, if you will, getting us in and out of... Uh, of places in the show. So here you go. This is Midist and then Mike Daly from Hollywood Records on the What Podcast. Mike, how are you? Good, man. It's I'm so be fun. I'm so happy that you're here uh, because this is a topic that I've been trying to uh, talk to people like you about for ever. I'm obsessed with what you do for a living. I'm obsessed okay. with what it is that um, the things that you can physically do and control. Um, I one time annoyed Sam Ryback from Interscope so <laughs> much over dinner that he eventually just had to get up and leave uh, because I just couldn't <laughs> stop talking about this. All right, so uh, this happens uh, a lot more than you might think, Mike. It actually uh, does. Yeah, it actually has nothing to do with the, it's, it's me. It's not the topic. Man, you must be going deep. Sam is such a mellow, awesome dude. I, I love know, he's Sam. really awesome. I'm a big, big fan. So. Uh, I want to start the, the conversation I want to have with you is, is so vast, but I, sure. I want to, I want to start from the beginning. Um, yeah. How in the world did you get to where you are oh. today? Where did it, where did it begin? Just the, the quick 30,000 foot view so we can lay a foundation as to what all this sure. thing is. I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll bullet point it for you. Sure. So like, you know, like every other 16 year old kid, I just wanted to be like the next guitar God. And then uh, I went to Berkeley and Boston for college. Somehow I talked my parents into that. And then after that, I was in a very not good indie rock band, signed to Bar None Records out of Hoboken in the Wayback Machine. What was the name and of the band? Then, 
What was the name? Oh, of the band? that that band was called Swales. S W A L E S. I think okay. we did one record. Uh, we tried really hard, and it really went nowhere. And then um, I started just doing sessions and playing for people around New York. And I was playing with Edith Frost, uh, who was on Drag City Records, a singer songwriter girl, totally awesome. And funny enough, when we did this tour, uh, and she moved to Chicago, and in her band was Glenn Kochi, who went on to be in Wilco. And then after I got home from the Edith Frost tour was when I joined Whiskey Town, and then did that till you know the the, the wheels eventually came off. Yeah. And um, ironically, at one point, Glenn had just started playing with Jeff, and we were trying to get Glenn to join Whiskey Town, and. Um, thank god for glenn's career he didn't and stayed with jeff and wilco and um then after that uh i was playing sessions and writing producing around new york did a ton of stuff i moved out here to la and i did a bunch of records for hollywood records like grace potter and um this great guy patrick park it didn't never worked out but he was amazing and then through my writing producing i've worked with like Lana Del Rey uh, and Imagine Dragons and Jason Mraz and tons of different people. And then about eight years ago, I think it was, Ken Bunt was taking over for Bob Cavallo. And he pitched me on this A&R idea. And, you know, I still write and produce outside of the label. And uh, I had always wanted the insight of how things work inside labels because I had developed bands and got them deals and then it would all sort of fall apart and I didn't really understand. So I felt like it'd be a good way to learn more. So I took the gig and uh, I've really, I've really enjoyed it, you know? Okay. So the reason why I love this topic so much and, and essentially it's how to make a hit and, okay. you know, when, when somebody like, so I wanna, first off, I want to warn you that there's going to be a lot of dumb questions. Uh, because, because you have this, you have almost like a Wizard of Oz sort of job in that I, people may know it exists, but they don't know what happens behind the curtain. They have no idea Meaning how it, no- yeah. yeah. Meaning there's nothing behind the curtain? Well, there may not be. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a great, I think that's a great intro. I keep hearing the Tom Petty song. My A&R guy says, I don't hear a single. Number yeah. one is, is the, is one thought that I have. And the other yeah. is when you were talking and I, it's so great that you're a producer songwriter, cause you come at it from that way. But from my perspective, 30 something years, it always seems like a band that's about to make it. It's the A and R guy that somehow screws it up. And, but what I mean by that is the A and R guy finds them, fair. loves them, you know, he's all in. And then he either moves up moves on, changes jobs or whatever, and the band is left sort of hanging. Is that even close to fair? I mean, that's what it seems like. I mean, I mean, it's hard to say, and I think it changes over time, right? Your, your A&R guy needs to be, our A&R guy was Mark Williams, who, you know, was on, you know, was over at Interscope then and Columbia and is a Concord now, and I still talk to Mark all the time. Your A and R guy has to be your white knight inside the building, right? And when you lose that white knight, unless you're a massive band, it's really hard. It's yeah. really, 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 really hard because you need somebody um, inspiring the troops inside the building all the time, and the manager can't do it in the same way. Um, so it's, it's a, and you're also, you know, when you're the a r person, you're, you're sort of by default always in a, a sticky situation, right? Because you're asked by other departments to ask the artist to do things that may be related to, I don't know, marketing or, or whatever that maybe they, they don't want to do or it hasn't been fully explained to them why they should do it. So it's always like, well, you, you talk to the band all the time or the artist, like you talk to them about it. And it's like, I'd really prefer you develop a relationship with them. Uh, but OK, so you're you're sort of always you're just always in an awkward position. You know, I have a very um, I have a 
few like ground rules with everybody I sign. Um, the first one is like, I will always tell you the truth, no matter if you want to hear it or not. Um, the second one, I am, I'm not your dad. So if you keep asking me the same question, you are definitely not going to wear me down. You will only get the same answer over and over and over again. <laughs> um, and number three, the day that I'm working harder on your career than you are is the day I drop you. And, okay. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a great place to start. What is an a and guy? Or a woman? I mean, a and guy or gal? Yeah, I will say some of the best a and people working in the business are women. By far, I would actually say I think women are have higher emotional intelligence in general, and I think they are generally less reactive. And I think make better A and R people. Just interesting as a blanket statement. Interesting. Um, having said that, you know, I look at my job is finding the talent, helping them in whatever it is. Right? It can be connecting them with writers and producers. It can be making sure that they don't work with outside writers and producers as to not dilute what it is. It's, you know, some of them need praise. Some of them need, you know, carrots and sticks. And you have to learn what each person responds to. And you have to really try to get into their world and understand how they see the world and what their perception of things are. So that's what you're sort of doing for them. And then inside the building you are the cheerleader the the therapist you are you're 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 whatever needs to be i i think of it as almost like being a manager who has deep musical knowledge and is also inside the building and and does the a and r guy need to come from a producing slash musician background do you think that it no. it helps no i don't think they need to be um for me, it's a and it's an advantage because when things aren't right, I can really talk to producers and say like, "There's too much 12k on the kick drum. It's you know, it's it's messing up the enunciation of the vocal in this spot." Like I can really like get in and we can just like uh-huh. fix shit. Like, uh-huh. oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to curse or not. <laughs> um, I think we're gonna be okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can go in there and fix it in a way that's beyond like, well, I don't know. I don't know. It's just not getting there because, you know, when I was full-time writing and producing, I would get notes back. Like, I don't know, man, just, you know, need some more of the sauce. It's like, I no I idea know what that means. I, I, I can't <laughs> translate sauce into pro tools in Ableton, but thank you. <laughs> There's not a filter um, for sauce. <laughs> yeah, I don't really like, where is my sauce plug in? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I think that it helps in the, in the communication. And I think that sometimes when you're trying to crack a code on a song, you know, a lot of the artists that I, I write with too are more like, I worked on a bunch on the first Young the Giant record, like writing with those guys. And not that they need an outside writer, but it was more, it was more like being like the designated hitter and like, well, you know, you can go here in your bridge or maybe you should talk about this or maybe like it was sort of like I was giving them options. But are they asking build, for well, are they asking for that feedback or are you throwing it in because it's your job? Um generally the people I work with ask for it. Okay. I don't I don't ever impose my writer producerness um on artists mm-hmm. unless they ask for it or their co-writer comes to me who you know i know everybody in the writing community here are like man what do you think and it's like and i'm honest like hey your pre course is too long or you you actually do need a bridge or lyric is a little boring in the second verse like my job is help them to get in there get it better so if i'm not involved in the actual writing of it it's like here are my general things like i said bridge is too long like whatever if they're asking me specifically can you come into the studio with us and really dig in and work on it then I will, and it's different. It then it's more like let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. Well, maybe this gets to one of the, the dumb questions, Brad. But uh, along those same lines, uh, the dumb questions Brad alluded to. If there's a meeting around a table, mm-hmm. where are you? Where is the A and R guy? Are you leading the meeting? Or are you? Do you, are you? You know what I mean? There's a manager. Yeah. There's a booking agent. There's a producer. There's the label head. 
in the pecking order around the table, where's the A&R guy? Well, everything is downstream from the music, right? I mean, without great music, everything else is just, you know, empty suits Fine, sitting yeah. around a table. Swimming you know upstream. what I mean? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So to me, uh, and, you know, I know a lot of people sign by data. We're not really a market share label. So we look at data, but, you know, I'm not trying to sign every kid on TikTok that gets a little bit of a buzz. In fact, I mean, in the in the um, example of Almost Monday, it was like the anti-data stuff. But back to, back to your question, as far as sitting around the table, it just depends on what the conversation is, right? If the conversation is about trying to get the music right for the album, like you're at the head of the table with the artist. And look, I tell all artists, like I will be honest with you, if there's a song that you love and I hate, it's your record. You can put your song on there, I don't, I don't care. The same time, if there's a song that's going to change your career and a hundred X your business and, and get you to stay in this 10 more years. Like I'm going to be very clear that you are making a very grave mistake. Okay. Um, okay so, know. so when you, <clears throat> when, okay, you, you become an, a, by the way, artist or repertoire, uh, you become an a and R guy. Um, and then you have to then producing artists that are making hits and making money. So, if you're not using a TikTok model, where are a and people, aside from TikTok and the internet, where are A&R people finding talent these days if they're not going to clubs anymore? Are they still well, going? Is that still happening? Yeah. Are you still walking into the 930 club and finding somebody? Uh, I love 930 club. Yeah. Um, well, not in the last 15 months. That's Yeah, it. sure. Um, you know, the thing about the pandemic is the pandemic has been devastating to a lot of people and to the economy, but it is also fast forwarded life. There's things we're doing now, Zooming, telemedicine, uh, remote work, uh, food delivery is now uh, at scale. These are all things that were going to happen in the next five to 10 years anyway. Mm -hmm. The pandemic just sped that all up. The adoption rate has gone higher. With that, it is also turbocharged the use of data to find things, right? Whether it be, you know, TikTok or, or YouTube or, or wherever. The majority of A&R is being done by internet, social media, streaming, things that are taking off on generally spotify a bit more than the others because you can just see the play counts mm -hmm. but it's more people digging into that kind of data but still a lot of the traditional things lawyers managers more managers i think the lawyers are there's so many deals happening right now that i think lawyers probably are too busy to actually shop deals um interesting lawyer shop deals yeah but it's more um, more managers and internet and probably shows again when it starts back up. Okay. But I don't know anybody who is like, yeah, I'm just going to roll down to the Troubadour tonight and see who's playing. Like that, yeah. that's at your check. I mean, even if you're going to like school night or some of the other LA sort of new artist shows, like you're definitely checking everybody out online beforehand. What, what has your year been? I mean, if you're not, if you're not, go are you focused on keeping the clients you have happy or finding new or, I mean, has it changed in that regard? I assume you're always looking for, you know, the next, uh, yeah. what's the last year been like? Well, a lot of zoom meetings, always looking for the next, obviously trying to keep artists and bands engaged and creative and trying to frame it as an opportunity. And I think that a, I've been lucky that a lot of my acts have seen it as an opportunity of like, wow, I don't have to go out and play every weekend. I can really focus on my craft of writing. And, you know, a lot of people did a lot of live streams and I, I think that live streams will stay, but I think that's going to morph into more of the, into the metaverse uh, world down, you know, the sort of that, that world of lives. I think that's where live streaming goes. So it's been a lot of that. And it's been, honestly, it's been a lot of just talking to people and lowering their anxiety about things. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have a lot of artists who, who hit a wall when it like they had all this stuff lined up and then it all went away. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have um, you, you find somebody like Almost Monday, who we talked to a couple of weeks ago. Mm. You find somebody like Almost Monday, even if it's a data driven thing, not a data driven thing. And then when you go to sign them, you're not going to be the only person trying to sign them. What is the competition like? And how do you break through to get the artists that you want to sign with you? Okay, so I'll give you two scenarios, right? So almost Monday, I was the only one trying to sign them. And my biggest fear was somebody was going to find out about them. 
I found Almost Monday because their mixer and co-producers manager, Andrew Brightman, who's a good friend of mine, said, hey, I got this band. I think you're going to like it. And he sent me three songs and I thought they were fantastic. And I said, I got to see this live. Like, when, when are they playing in? I got to see this live. He said, well, they have this one show, but don't come because it's not a real show. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, OK, cool. I will definitely be there. And he's like, no, no, you really, you know. And I was like, no, no, it's cool. I will, like, I've played these shows. I know what I'm walking into. So it was Memorial Day. It was Memorial Day a year and a half ago or so. And it was at the Santa Monica uh, hang airport hangar. And it was a high school girl throwing a music and art show. Every person there, the median age was maybe 15. And uh, me and my buddy rolled up. They were playing in a room. There was no PA. Mark Needham was there and had like a mini mixer in his trunk that he broke out. And I met the band before for a couple minutes. I'm like, cool, cool guys, like whatever. Then I was out, like, I think they had a taco truck there or something, getting a taco. I tried to go back in to see the band and a 15 year old kid was like, no, you have to pay. And I was like, no, I paid. I was just in there. He's like, man, you can't be sneaking in. And I was like, dude, do you, I mean, <laughs> Do you really think I'm like, I mean, I will pay you again, but do you really think I'm sneaking into this? Um, which was like, sort of, we all joke about it. And I went in. That kid, that kid's going to be, going to be a CEO yeah. one day. Yeah. That hiring kid's be running That's the, the world. kid I want right there. Yeah. I, kid, I know. Really? I was like, you want an internship? Yeah. Um, so uh, after I talked my way past the 15 year old. Uh, bum, bum rush the show. You did you? Yeah, I did, man. I did. I went in and the band was, started playing in this room and it sounded terrible i mean it was so abusive to the ears the songs were so good and dawson was like i felt like i was watching like in excess his first club gig he had so much of like that thing on stage and i was i was literally taking video of it and i sent it to the label president and i was like i'm signing this band or i'm quitting my job wow and uh wow. ken was like calm down He's like, that kid looks like a star. I'm like, these songs are bangers. I was like, we're going to do this. So we talked to him afterwards. They had no lawyer. <laughs> they had no booking agent. Mm -hmm. They had no manager. And they, they sort of confessed this to me very secretly. And I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. This is great. So they hooked up uh, through Andrew with Nick Ferrara, who's an amazing attorney. And um, I think they thought I was gonna be bummed out. They didn't have all the infrastructure, but I was like, no, this is great. Like, no, it's, it's actually uncle, better for you that way. Well, I could just get them the best team in the world. Yeah. And now they have Andy Mendelssohn at full stop managing him, who has Kings of Leon and is so great. And Marty Diamond mm -hmm. uh, is their booking agent, right? It's like they have a world-class team because the other thing with any of this is that without the best team around it, it's not going to work. I don't really care how good the music is. If you have a terrible manager, it's not going to work. It's, it's too hard. So that's the arc of them. And 14 days after that show, the deal was signed. That Boy, that raises a whole nother. It's another thing that I've run into many, many times is if there's more than two people in a band, it's complicated, right? Then you start adding in girlfriends and wives and managers and the bass player wants to be huge, but the drummer doesn't. How much of that do you have to, um, well, there's a, there's a, a rude word for it, but fix is what I'm un unscrew, I guess is what, how, how often does that happen where you've got a great talented band, but something is just broken, you know, whether it's like you said, manager or a girlfriend or mis well, misguided expectations one way, you know, from one or the other? Well, I think that going into it, I have a lot of conversations with people about like, who do you want to be? Like, and you know, almost Monday from San Diego, I'm like, great. Do you want to be the Kings of San Diego or do you want to be the Kings of the world? Like, like exactly. what is your ambition? And like, I live in Silver Lake here and you know, there's a lot of super cool Silver Lake bands that really just want to be super cool bands. And like, that's awesome. It's not a business I can invest in. Um, because that's just not the business model we're in. So you just have to make sure everything is aligned and, you know, you just have to manage expectations, everybody's expectations all the way down the line, you know, from, from moment one, you, you have to manage expectations. And then as far as managers, 
there's not a whole lot you can do because you can get, you know, there's torturous interference laws. And so you hope that they don't have a bad manager. The girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever thing, you know, those sort of seem to work themselves out because generally the other people in the band will finally throw down um, and sort of and, and solve that. But I, I'm pretty I'm pretty honest with people. And I've, you know, you can ask anybody who of a and R um, that I, I will tell them generally, like you're you're making a mistake, and I know why you don't see it as a mistake, but you are making a mistake. I assume with your experience, can you identify those problem bands pretty quickly? Are there cases where you you know you <laughs> thought you had a great one, and boy, I didn't see that coming, or can you identify it pretty quickly, like? this band, there's a problem here and it's either going to have to be fixed or I'm walking type of thing. They say that love is blind. I tend to think talent is blinding. So it is very hard sometimes to see reality when that's not the reality you want to see. And I think that that's a symptom of being a human more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So I just really, really try to look at things through as an unbiased view as I can. Having said that, there, there was one artist I had at some point and we had a sit down and I just said look this is what you did previously this is what your last tour did and either we need to make some changes or you should realize that you peaked a year and a half ago and that's uh, a tough conversation it's a tough conversation and half and, and it was like a 50 50 split and I was just like you guys should go decide what you want to do it's your lives you don't have to do this. I'm not, I would love to, I would love to keep doing it with you guys and it's all good, but and, and I don't, of course, I, I don't force anybody to do anything. And of course this is all not just, you know, in a, in a money-making opportunity, but this is what they laid out as their goals when they first sat down with you at the beginning and said, this is who I want to be. This is what I want to be. And how do I get there? Uh, you know, you talked a lot about the data and or I'll put it this way you talked about the the second verse being you know too long or when you are crazy so after you sign them after you have uh, gone through the competition after you get them in the studio and you're starting to craft a song and you're starting to craft a career what is the most important thing that you try to get them to do are you looking for them to write a radio hit are you writing are you trying to get them to um, make money are you trying to see what song works best with a sync um, what are the goals that you sit down to try and uh, flesh out when you make a you know when you have the band now in the studio i have one goal quality that's it that's all we can control is how good the music is. Everything else you can influence, but you cannot control it. So to me, I don't really think about, is this a radio song? Is this a sync song? Is this bridge going to blow up on TikTok? Or, mm. or, or anything like that. To me, it's how do we make the art as good as it can be? Because commerce follows art. Art never follows commerce. That's not the way the universe works. And that's the, for me, like, that's, that's it. I mean, it's, it's that, it's that simple. Like, yes, it's great when they go like, wow, I played this for the radio staff and they're freaking out. Like, that's amazing. And I also think at some point in people's careers, if you want to put out an album that doesn't have like hit songs or radio songs or whatever, and you've earned it then go ahead. I mean, you know, there is no amnesiac without Kid A. Mm. Like, let's face the facts. Mm. No Kid A, you don't get to make amnesiac. Mm -hmm. You know, like hits and big songs buy you freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's that freaking simple. Yeah, I mean, that that's the Cohen brother model, you know? Yeah, I, that's right. Put out a movie that everybody likes, and then I can start making the stuff that I really want to make. Right. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm Steve Buscemi, same way. Yeah. How much of your job, Mike, and you've kind of said it, but how much of your job is pushing and how much is pulling? Oh, man, that's a great question. I think it depends on the day. I think it also depends on the context. I generally, going back to my, the day I work harder on your career than you is the day I'm dropping you. Right. Um, I generally, I will tell people when they're messing up, I will drive to make things as, as great as they can be. 
But if I feel like I'm dragging an artist along, then I will tell them like, I'm no longer doing this because it won't work. Scott Litt, who I don't know if you know who Scott Litt is, massive producer, produced like Nirvana Unplugged and uh, Mixed Walking on Sunshine, actually. But, <laughs> you know, Scott Litt, when Whiskey Town was signed to Outpost, he was one of the founders at Outpost. I remember him telling me years later, he's like, you can't outwork the artist. I know why you think you can. I know why you think you can catch every falling knife. You cannot work out the artist. The artist is always the tip of the arrow. And if they're not, stop. It will not work. It's it just, it's not the way it works. But but am I, am I right to assume though, every artist's version of work is different? You know, some artists are going to work really hard at radio. Some artists are going to be really um, great workers in the studio. Not, I mean, I, I had a boss one time tell me that the the farm needs thoroughbreds and worker mules. You can't all be thoroughbreds. Mm-hmm. You can't all sure. be worker mules. So yeah. every artist is going to work differently based on, I guess, whatever goal that they have set out to you for, right? Right. But that, that is true. But they have to do the hard work in all areas. It's too hard anymore. It's just too hard. You cannot have a career if your songs aren't streaming and you're not going on tour and you're not really working on your craft, mm. then you're a hobbyist. Mm. It, then, then this is a hobby. Along along those lines, that's a great question. Mm. And I, I had a boss said the same thing, Brad. We have, you know, thoroughbreds oh, and, and, and mules. How much conversation do you have to have like within almost Monday I mean another conversation I've had for many many years is an artist a lot of them don't want to do the marketing they don't want to do the interviews they don't want to do the not performing parts you know what Mm -hmm. I mean they just think this is all I'm going to do but you really have to have the whole package don't you I mean you 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 do and now you got social media and all this other stuff look, nobody's going to want to do everything and artists shouldn't do everything, you know? And I don't really want artists who are like, I will do anything, right? It's like, you don't really want that either, but you have to figure out why they don't want to do it. If they don't want to do it because they're scared of doing it wrong or scared of looking foolish in their dumb friend's eyes or that stuff, then you have to sort of work through that. But everything is about the why, right? Like, why don't you want to do it? And if you say, look, I don't want to do that interview with whatever, because I have a deep held philosophical view that is very different than the parent company of that organization. God bless. Cool. Totally get it. If you say, I don't want to meet with the Spotify people because um, I think it's better for me to be mysterious after a show, then it's like, then you're an idiot. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like you are living out a fantasy that is based on fear. You don't want to meet them because you don't think you're enough and you think they're going to see through you. So let's get to the root of that and let's figure it out. Because if you don't want to do those things, then again, you're a hobbyist. Professionals do the work. Hobbyists only do the play. When, when do you, when, so right now in the, in, the, in, the, in the climate that we're in now, what is the most important thing for a band to accomplish, whether they're new, established, et cetera? What, what do they need to do to, in the next six months? Depending on where they are in their career, I would tweak the answer a little bit, but net, net overall, get better at your art and everything else follows. Get the songs as great as they can be. Because if you're great at social media, you're great at all this stuff and your music sucks, even if you get it going, it's going to run out of steam. Whereas if the songs are just great and you're consistent, that's another thing you really need these days is just consistency, then you will get somewhere. And then suddenly you'll realize like, wait, my social media is actually sort of taking care of itself. And I don't really have to tend that garden as much because of the strength of the song. Your song is sort of your fur for everything else. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it sort of walks me into a kind of a delicate territory that I know Mm -hmm. is sensitive to uh, your side of the industry. So when, uh, okay, so you get a great song, but Uh you're not judged as an A&R guy just on great songs, right? Uh At some point, like, what is the judgment for for you, for your boss, for your peers? And how much pressure is there on you to perform at that level every time? Me personally, we're in a, our label is a little bit different. We have 25 to 30 artists on the label, whereas a lot of the other majors have 125. There is pressure to perform. Um, but at the same time, for me, again, all I can control is how good the art is. 
I can't control if the marketing department does their job or the streaming department or, or, or whoever. Mm-hmm. And that's all I can control. So that's all I really focus on. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, if I look at some things at the label that we've done where we have had big streaming numbers or have had hits with them, you know, it's always been, it's always been things really of quality. And that's what I just sort of stand on yeah. is that, you know, because otherwise if you just go, Oh, this thing is blowing up and you start chasing stuff. That's a hit. Now, by the time you find something and get it out, it's moved on anyway. Everything moves too fast these days. Well, geez, that was, yeah, sorry, Andrew, but the, that's sort of where I was going. It's like art is so subjective and mm-hmm, we have, there's so many different opinions about this and that. And it always felt like a and guys, their one mission was to perform hits get hit after hit Mm -hmm. after hit after hit and if you're not a hit machine then what happens i'm just trying to figure out are we in a world right now where hits are not necessarily as important because there's so many other pathways for an artist to be successful a dsp the right sync a festival shot you know there's a different version of success these days than just having you know, chart success. Yeah. Well, I think you get, I think you've gotten to the heart of it, which is what a hit is, is harder to define now than ever, right? Like somebody has a hundred million streams on a song. Is it a hit? I don't know. You like, what, 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 how do we define a hit? It used to be a lot easier when hits were like, oh yeah, it's on, you know, however many radio stations and it's doing this and that's driving as many CD sales every week, right? But you have songs that are crushing at streaming and aren't on the radio at all. You have other mm-hmm. songs that are on the radio and are a hit, mm-hmm. I guess. But you couldn't but sell a ticket streams. to their show. But couldn't you couldn't sell, sell a ticket right, to their it, show. So yeah. it's so it's so amorphous. I try to look at everything and I was having a conversation with a friend of mine at Virgin about this the other day as, you know, I also think the day and age of the music superstar is sort of behind us. I don't think you'll ever see the Michael Jackson level, the U2 level of superstar again. I think people's attention is bifurcated in a bajillion different ways now. And I think that you have to look at each of these artists and these acts as like a small business. And how do you grow this small business into a very healthy business? It can't be, you. if you exist only in black and white, that like, this is like a complete smash. Like, the numbers are so small when you look at the things signed, the things that come out compared to that. I don't think anybody would have a job anymore. So I tend to look at it. Like I think about like, if you're one of the two guys that founded Google, right? You're super crazy rich, right? But if you're the guy who owns 10 gas stations in San Francisco, you're probably pretty rich too. Are you ever going to be as rich as the Google guy? No. But that doesn't mean you're not rich. <laughs> so if you you know if you have a band that's generating income for themselves, labels getting a return, they're they have a good touring business, a great sync business, or whatever, like that's a viable business. I mean, and is, you can invest in those businesses. That is an along, amazing way of putting it. I never thought about it that way, but it is so right. Yeah, along those lines, Mike. I mean, for you personally, I, I'm going. I mm-hmm. keep going back to. I mean, what you just said and the Cohen brothers sort of metrics. For you, I mean, do you have to have that hit so that you can sign two, three, four, you, you know, that you love that maybe aren't going to have that ginormous hit? Do you have to worry about that? And how much of what you do personally is kind of the what have you done for me lately thing? You know, at what point does it become nervous time for you? I got to find some the next thing because i'm always looking for the next thing i don't think i ever go into the wake up in the three in the morning sort of panic like oh my god i gotta find the next thing you know look we all want hits we all want things to work and i'm always looking and i'm probably harder on myself than anybody at the label is so i don't you know i feel my own internal pressure Um, much more i think than pressure exerted um, upon me. Um, I will say that the majority of things that I brought in and we didn't get uh, have blown up. Uh, A lot of things that we did get either are on their path to becoming big or maybe we're out of business now, but did really good business 
in the interim. And um, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a it's a it's a hard job. I mean, yeah, it's a I really it's a really 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 difficult hard job because you have a lot of the responsibility and not a lot of the control. And I think any job where you have those two um, yeah, wow. crosswinds, it's tough. You know, I mean, it's really tough. Look, I, I, I purport to, to know not much, but if there's something I do know, it always felt to me like the uh, A&R guy was, was the hardest job in the entire industry. And that's why I'm so interested in it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I appreciate your time. I mean, I really do. This, this, I could literally talk about this all day. I mean, there was- Dude, I'm- I'm happy to keep going. We don't, I, you I, know, love this. I don't, so I, I asked this question uh, of Sam one night at dinner and yeah. he absolutely refused to answer me. Uh, so I asked <laughs> him again and again and again. And so I, I have it. a feeling I know what your answer is going to be, but am I going to, uh, am I going to text Sam this question just to see if he uh, has PTSD? Maybe. <laughs> what is, is there one that was this close that got away that you wanted really, really bad? I'll tell you why, why you think the reason why Sam uh, refused to answer that is because he said, because I'm going to sign him one day and I'm not going to tell you who it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, Sam is the best. Yeah. Boy, let me think about that. None of them keep me up at night because I just, I just move on and I, I, I wish them well. I'm trying to think of, I mean, I will tell you, I saw Sam Hunt open for Chase Rice in Boston years ago, before he had a deal, before he had anything, he was playing acoustic guitar and singing. He had a guitar player and they were playing to tracks and the songs are just unbelievable. And we do have a lot of joint ventures in Nashville, our label, but we didn't have the infrastructure to really, to, to, to do that. So that was one that was like, oh I man. I love that answer. And I'll tell you why, yeah. what year was that? It's gotta be seven uh, years, eight years. Uh, I, don't, reason, I, I don't remember. The reason I ask is because um, the reason I love that is because there's there was something in you that said, based on what was happening in country music, the way that it was crossing over, the way that just some of the guys just looked, right? He had the look, he's got the sound, he's got the songs, and you probably said to yourself, I think that's where country's going. Well, it was funny. I was there to see Chase Rice, um, who I... I mean, I literally left the venue and called the president of the label. I'm like, okay, so here's the news. I want to sign both of these guys. And uh, I was there to see Chase because Chase at the time, you know, he was on, um, John Marks was playing him when he was at the highway. And it was a rainy Sunday night in Boston. And it was at Paradise. And it was freaking packed. Mm -hmm. And people were singing along to songs that weren't on the radio. It was like, this is real. We didn't, we didn't get Chase. Um, we, we just weren't, at the time, we weren't really set up to do that. So it was like, and like I, I stumbled across Pink Sweats, who I love yeah. before, before anything. I think I actually, I think I might have actually sent Pink Sweats to Sam if I don't. No, Pink I Sweats is Atlantic now. Um, yeah, but I sent it before we signed. Oh, I think really? I sent it to Sam. But like, I mean, again, it's not something that our label was set interesting. up interesting so interesting so there's there's and there's inner dynamic trading happening there's like uh other you send them to somebody else sometimes just because you know it's probably going to work out a little bit better and they've got an infrastructure well, for it life is too short don't we all just want to get good music into the world and like i'm not i'm not in competition with atlantic i'm in competition yeah. with mike daly every morning that i yeah. wake up with well, like yeah. jump, let me jump on that because yeah. that and it's an obvious question and and i think you've probably alluded to some of the answers but what are the reasons you just mentioned the one we weren't prepared for it but what are the reasons that you wouldn't get an act i mean i'm well, thinking everything from you just personally don't hit it off oh. to they like somebody i mean what are the sort of reasons why mike daly doesn't get somebody whatever whatever uh, well i can think of a i can like roll decks through deals we haven't gotten you know, for us, the selling part of our label is that there's 25 to 30 artists. So you get time, you get attention. We don't do like one EP, it didn't work. Then you sit on the shelf for three years or you get dropped or, or whatever. We don't, we don't do that, right? So you get time and you get attention. Our label has as many streaming people, radio people as any other major label. And we're housed inside the world's biggest entertainment company, right? So you get all of these other 
opportunities that you would never have gotten, right? So that's sort of the sell. Now I've lost deals because other people have just come in and paid an ungodly amount of money. Mm -hmm. I've lost deals because managers are, were, I can think of one deal was really, really good friends with the president of another label. So they got it. Um, there was another deal we lost because the artist was very good friends with uh, another artist who was on a big label and they went to the same label as that big artist. Um, you know, sometimes, it, you know, uh, I mean, those are some of the ones I could think of sort of off the top of my head. I mean, we're not like, like I said, we have a lot of joint ventures in country. So we have one with Warners and we have most of them with Universal down there. And we have a couple of things with, with both of them, which is great. But the other, but the other unsaid part of all this is that you work on a budget too. You know, uh -huh. you have, you don't have an endless amount of money. Like you just can't no. just like sign everybody and anybody that you want to. You have to be really diligent about the ones that you are putting resources behind. But let me stop you there. We have to be more diligent because we're not a market share company. And right? now so explain the difference between the two. Market share, when you're at more of a market share company and that's any kind of company, right? Like look at Spotify. Like I love Spotify. Spotify uses millions upon millions upon millions of dollars a year, right? So does Netflix. They're growth companies, right? For us, we work on money in, money out right? For some of the other labels, it's all just about increasing market share. So you can lose a million dollars on something, but increase market share. And it's seen as a win. Barry, right? Barry, it's a masterclass. I mean, I love, uh, this, is this is amazing. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think I'm a little out of my depth on really getting right. into so, market share definitions with other labels, but I got, I got one for you. I'm, I'm 18 years old. I'm talented. I want to, I want to record. I want to be a a star, I think. Um, what are the things that I need to, what are the questions I need to ask a Mike Day who comes to an airport hangar and hears me at a horrible show? What are the things I need to be asking, <laughs> thinking of to protect myself? Right. Uh, let's look at it from that point of view, not your point of view. You know, what are some yeah. of the, okay. what are the, what are the lies I need to be worried about? What are the truths? What are the, you know, I'm 18 years old. I don't know anything. What would you right. have told young Mike Daly when he was in Sweens <laughs> or whatever the name of the yeah, band Swales. was? <laughs> Swales, yeah. Uh, um, you know, I, I think you need to ask as many questions as you can, right? I think you need to ask like, how does the label work? What are the different departments do? I, I think you just, you, God, man, I would ask everything. Like, how do you see our music? Where do you see us in three to five years? What do you think the, the, the steps to success are? Um, I mean, because the, the, the cliche or whatever is, you know, I'm 18, I'm signing the first piece of paper put in front of me, you know, and if, if you show me zeros, I'm in. And now I've given, you know, we've all heard the horror stories of the artists who've given away their catalogs and, and all that. Does that still happen today? Like, I know it does. I don't I think mean, it just happened, happened with like Taylor it Swift a couple of years ago. Yeah. Well, that's well I won't wade into the Taylor thing. Um, but because she will find us and she will eat us alive. I'm not no, kidding. because she didn't give them away because Scott Borchetta yeah, I know. I mean, I got you, invested right. heavily in her career when she was 16. So, but I won't wait into that. Well, one. I give, I'll give you an example. A buddy of mine is in sort of the promotions business and he's got a couple mm -hmm. of acts that he has helped increase their social media numbers to a large Great. degree. They go from, so here's this guy, a young artist, very talented, goes from nobody to tens and tens and thousands of social media. And he wants to walk away from my buddy who's helped him because, as he says, I'm the one with the talent. You haven't done anything uh, for me. So but they've had a contract. So it happens. all. I'm coming at this yep. a different way than my original question. But that's the kind of thing I'm I'm asking is I'm young. You know, all I want to be is a star. Uh, somebody comes at me with a piece of paper and zeros, you know, what's the bet? You answered the question with asking questions, but I'm just wondering, are there top five things, top three things? If you hear this run, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I think anybody who says like, it's definitely going to work. <laughs> 
<laughs> like okay, fair enough you know <laughs> like that that's definitely like oh man um <laughs> you know it's like it's like always and never are like the two most dangerous words in the english language because somebody who says something always happens is lying to you and somebody who says that something never happens is also lying to you yeah. um because that's not reality that's not the human existence or the human experience rather so I think anybody who tells you it's def- anything is definitely going to work, uh, I'd be I'd be scared of. Um, but I don't think I, I don't really I don't see uh, we don't do any of those crappy deals. Um, I'm sure those deals are out there, um, but I don't really have any exposure to them. And okay. it's like anything else, like get a good entertainment lawyer. You know, like your uncle who's a Personal injury, injury lawyer should not be looking at your record deal. <laughs> it, it, you know? Brad, hey, Brad, well, isn't that one of the things Jeff Becker, who is an entertainment lawyer, if you remember, isn't that what he said is uh, better to have a lawyer at the beginning than later? Yeah. You know, spend, <laughs> I love that. Spend the few dollars at the front end rather than come see me later. Well, I mean, it goes late. to what it goes to what he said, what Mike said earlier. You know, the um, the first name that you mentioned, the first person, the first entity you mentioned when you started talking about this was lawyer. I mean, it's it's the first thing you probably should should put you know, yeah, put on your backside immediately. You know, you need somebody at your back. You need somebody that's got you, and a lawyer is probably the best thing. But to the point of, of all of this, do you think that recorded? How about this? Do you think recording success is dependent as much on record labels these days as it had been in the past? It's an interesting question. It's a great question. <laughs> because you, you have a couple different forces at work here, right? One force is now it's pretty economical to record in your bedroom and make you know, really good sounding records. And, you know, the, the, it used to be it was so expensive to record that there, there was so many gatekeepers and there's a lot of barriers to enter, right? So those are gone, which I think is great. I think that it's great that people can express themselves. And I'm a true believer in, in art. So I think that that's amazing. Conversely now, you know, I heard a statistic the other day, something like 40,000 new songs get uploaded every day to the DSPs, Spotify, Apple, Amazon. It's so much. It's so much music that you need to find a way to stand out amongst that sea, right? And some things just raise their hand and get on some yeah. good playlists and, and, and whatever. But I think that record labels add a lot of value there. I think yeah. record labels are very good at expanding people's worlds, right? Like, I think it, it's very good at um, giving them a bigger view, like introducing them to people connecting dots just making their world bigger yeah um and again it's it's a little bit of a tricky area because defining success is completely you know like i have friends of mine who do it all on their own they make music for like yoga and meditation and they make a great living at it and they do it all on their own but they don't you know they, they have no ambition to tour the world and you know they make they love what they do to make a great living and that's yeah. success to them. I mean, it goes back to a, a lesson that the old man would say to all, to every old man, everybody's dad has said to him at some point, you know, that job ain't coming knocking at the door. You know, you got to go out and get a job and it's not just going to come find you, um, you know, to, to get out and, and actually do something. You probably mm. need to, to, you know, put yourself out there and do it. It's just because you put a song out doesn't mean the world's just going to come to you. Those, those things just don't happen very often. I mean, in your experience, you can probably count, you know, on one hand, how many people have truly hit success and a level of, of major success from recording in your bedroom. Um, Billie Eilish, you know, yeah. well, I mean, maybe, many, but I'm, what, I'm hearing, you what I'm hearing from this entire conversation Mike, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but it just really depends on what you want, right? I mean, it depends on the That's a lot of it. what they really want. If they want to do yoga soundtracks and be successful at it, then uh, don't put them on the road in a van, you know? And, and uh, if you want to be a star and you don't want to ride in the van, you need to know about that. So that it sounds like that's where the conversation, as you said at the very beginning, 
has to be two way. It has to be open and it has to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's aligning, it's aligning goals, managing expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, and that's what it is all the way, all the way down the line. It's like, you know, you have an artist and songs going to radio and they're so psyched. It's like, you should know this might not work. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the final thing I got for you, uh, because you've been so generous with your time. I mean, by the way, yeah, by the way, Barry, uh, he ain't living a tough life. Uh, look at that backyard. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I nice. have, uh, I have perfected this square. the camera angle yeah it's i really perfected good. The, the camera angle of my yard over the pandemic i yes. keep waiting for the umbrella drink to be delivered <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, i should have done that's a really good idea yeah the the row of bikini clad women behind the camera right now <laughs> are just Drinks. waiting to deliver <laughs> him uh my tie so if you are if, being being uh, an a be on your level of an anr guys one thing but there's a whole level of people under you that are signing bands like like even and these are usually kids. These are usually young, aggressive kids. Right. Are you seeing like those are the guys that are I'll put it this way to get where you are. You got to put in the work. Do you think that mm-hmm. you got to make your chops uh, to get to where you are by hustling on the streets and, um, you know, chasing down that act or that band that could get you to the next level. Is it still uh, that kind of process? I think it's always at some level that process, something that they're not, they're not passionate about, or they don't think that they can really add value to or whatever. I just, I just think it's too hard. Yeah. You think it's a harder job than you got in a lot of ways. Yeah. Because you know, with, (laughs) With manager, you're always at the you know you're at the mercy of the artist. The artist can fire you at any minute. Yeah, you know? and, and, and in most cases, you haven't gotten paid yet. Yeah, yeah I mean, Working there's so spec. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, how many management deals end in lawsuits? Like a lot. Mm. Look, and and this is where selfishness comes in. There's never been a time in my life where I've not said to myself, yeah, "I'd really like to be an A and R guy." Uh, and uh, <laughs> the I'm not kidding. Like, and then one day I was sitting here in new orleans and this guy i was watching i was like this guy is unbelievable i love this dude so much and he walked up afterwards he's like hey you want to be our manager and i said oh god no no i never <laughs> no I never want to do that ever in a million years um it is it is a daunting world and uh for those who have the guts and the the passion to do it you guys are there's not many of you and but, there's and there's even fewer that that do it really really well and so all the credit in the world to you man that's a well that's I, a I would say it's gig. all hard you know it's all hard it's hard being a manager it's hard being an agent you know it's it, it's hard you know being a dj it's hard you know putting on festival it's all it's it's an easy you know it's not an easy business and it's hard being the artist i mean that's the other thing that we have to remember like i did it like i spent a lot of my years on tour and it ain't easy man so mm-hmm. like we really have to have empathy for all the other moving parts it ain't easy being the creative director who sent five things through for them to look at for photo shoots and everybody hates everything it's not easy i mean look at videos i mean how do you even make a good music video like i feel mm-hmm. like almost every video is terrible <laughs> and then one is like really good like i don't Man. It's, 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 has there really been, hard. has there, has there been a great music video since Corn's Freak on a Leash though? I mean, it really oh, was man. the great music video since, uh, since Jackson, you know, but I do appreciate you talking about how difficult, um, my job is because Lord, I, uh, it's very <laughs> difficult. I want Barry and Taco to realize this hair <laughs> works very, very hard. Well, it's carried you this far is all I know. <laughs> So. <laughs> Mike, they, may, I, I, I appreciate this so much. I, I, I love you to death. And I'm so glad that we got to, uh, we got to, you know, talk shop a little bit and, and you got to dissect a part of the industry that so rarely gets, gets yeah. talked about and, and exposed like this. So thanks for being the wizard of Oz. Of today. I appreciate it, buddy. Absolutely. Man, any, any time I had fun, fun, All you right, know, good. I'm around. All right. Well, Amazing, next, Mike. next Thank time so I'm out much. West, I'm coming to the porch for the Mai Tai. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. See you soon. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, buddy. Oh, the... 
beautiful tones of Midist, M-I-D-I-S-T. Follow them on Bandcamp, follow them on Spotify. Give them a listen. Uh, they're very good friends of ours, and they were gracious enough to uh, allow us to use their uh, unbelievable work on the uh, the what podcast, which bands this year that matter. That's Barry Quarter. I'm Brad Steiner. Thanks for sticking with us. That uh, was Mike Daly from Hollywood Records. The the thing that I mentioned before the sh- before the uh, interview was that it's such a hard job. Well, it's not just a very difficult job because you have to produce over and over and over. Yes, I think that Mike says it over and over that he's, you know, just about the quality of work. I think that that's adorable. Um, And I think that there is part of that that's true. But man, you still got to deliver, you know? I mean, there are very few labels in, in the world that, and again, I know that people hate this, but this is still a label generated and dominated industry. Now, you can make it work without a label, and so many people do, but at some point you need them. And whether it's distribution, whether it's uh, representation, you need them at some point to hit a level that you want to attain. Um, Very few people can do it without them. And like it or not, that's just sort of what the industry is. I think that he can be very open about it wanting to be quality of work, Mm -hmm. but I think he's still, and doesn't probably want to admit, he's still got to produce hits. He's got to produce hits and he's got to have people around him who believe in him. And that's, I, I think I asked him about it and he mentioned it a little bit, but that's one of the things that I've seen over the many, many years is an act who has signed, who looks like their, you know, trajectory is skyrocketing mm-hmm. and then something happens. Uh, the A and R guy gets a promotion, or the label head moves, or somebody moves, or some something changes. It can be small thing; doesn't have to be a pandemic. And if everybody's not on board, mm-hmm. you know, suddenly it can it can get derailed. And I loved hearing him talk about um, sort of who's who's at the head of the table in the conference room. You know, depends on the meeting type of thing that's a also depends on the person too you know i mean yeah there are there are several i mean go around the the history of of the industry you know there are people in the industry that will will be the head of the table and you're not uh some a and r guys are not gonna let anybody else be the head of the table you know um you know clive davis ain't letting anybody else talk you know well he's got a track record He's got yeah, a track right. record to That's back right. it up. That's right. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of this for maybe that podcast listener out there who's in wherever, Iowa, Montana. We all have it. We all have that band that we, you know, were the, whether they played our fraternity or they play in our town, who we think this is great. They're the next big thing. And, and it's, you know, why – Why aren't they making it or where they're almost about to make it. And so that's what I'm thinking about when, when, with these interviews that we're doing, hopefully everyone can kind of see what has to happen. You know, I, you know, I I know that I get, I get beat up a lot because of Hootie and the blowfish, but when you really think about it, the way that artists are being found now, um, there are no Hootie and the blowfishes anymore. You know, there are no just bar bands mm. that are hanging out on college campuses that are just magically found and then given a record deal. And within six months, their lives are changed. There's yeah. just so few of those. Right? Um, right. You have to have I mean, Alabama Shakes were sort of that way I mean, she was she was delivering mail for crying out loud. But, yeah. you know, there's yeah. so few of those these days because of TikTok and, and how. Yeah. Um, well, you know, how the social, how YouTube and social media has completely changed the paradigm of, of, of how people find product. To your point, uh, Kane Brown, a country artist from the Chattanooga area here, blew up, was doing cover songs on uh, social media. And his numbers were huge and, and continued, but he couldn't get a meeting for the longest mm. time until they got so big because the label people were thinking it was a, you know, a TikTok or a social media flash in the pan. Well, he's proven them. <laughs> he's, he's proven to be a pretty big star in the country music scene, but well, to that, your yeah. point, well, there yeah, was, and if, and if you don't have a TikTok and a social media presence right now, you're not even getting a meeting. You're not even getting the, yeah, a sniff. That's exactly to your point. Yeah. So it's all, you got to have those numbers and then, and then you got to back them up, I guess. So it's yeah uh, it's well, so 
So, right. so that so that shows you how a band is found, how it is nurtured, but you know it still takes. You can like Barry says, you can have all of the talent in the world, but if you don't have the hit, and if you don't have the the right songs, you're just not going to. You're going to be spinning in place, right? I think of a, a band, and they're coming to town here, and I love them, and they're good people. But but it needs to be said, the band like the Struts, who have an incredible live show. They have. Uh, they were in this, this place a couple of years ago where they're that close. They were almost there and they just never got there. Yeah. You know, if you remember back in the early aughts, there was a band by Mr. Butch Walker. I love Butch Walker and Marvelous 3. Marvelous 3 just couldn't get there. They just, could, just couldn't get to that next step. And now Butch Walker is producing, you know, major artists. There, it, it, it happens over and over and over and it has to take that right chemical compound that brings everything together. Um, for that right song to hit and when it does though you're yeah. you're made for the rest of your life <laughs> yeah an interesting thing that we've learned i think um mike seemed very confident in his ability to pick a a, a viable act say mm-hmm. and so did Allie. remember when we asked her uh she was one of the two booking agency agents that we talked to do you know when a band is good or is it just you know, basically dumb luck. And she very firmly said, I know when they're good. Uh, that's, a, that's another, th- I find that fascinating. And obviously I would hope she would say that, but, um, well, if, if it's interesting, if, still if confidence is your thing, then I've got the guy for you. Uh, the quiet confidence of Mr. Troy Hansen, who is the head of rock for cumulus broadcasting is going to take us through next week. When these bands start to get their shot, He's the guy they go to. He's the one they call. You know, there, there are three people in radio, at least rock radio, that make the entire thing work. Three people. You can add a couple more. You know, you can, you can add, and this is radio, though, but you can add a couple more on the periphery, like, um, you know, some satellite radio people and, you know, Ali Hagendorf from, from Spotify, who is a major, you know, component in all of this. But when it comes to getting played on the radio, which is still, no matter what you think, the biggest music discovery portal that the country uses. Still 90% of people interact with radio on a daily and weekly basis. So, you know, it's still how the industry gets the message out and it's still how they deliver um, what eventually be, will be hits. Troy is one of the three people that you got to go to to make it work. And... Um, how he then picks the songs that he picks. I will try to take my radio programmer hat off and try and be a, uh, just a listener with some, some you know, general questions so that you understand exactly how decisions like that get made and who gets played on the radio and who gets the shot over the guy who you thought had it all. Yeah. How about we let uh, listeners, if they have a question or two, send it to us. And we'll That'd be ask. great. Yeah. Yeah. Tell it, ask us if you have any, you know, how do you, you know, look, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a maddening process because people have this impression about radio that it just doesn't matter anymore, but it still is the most effective medium to get um, music discovery out because it's, it casts such a wide net. So yeah, hit oh, us I- up at the what podcast on Twitter. And by the way, the same place that you can, register for tickets if yeah, you want to do that yeah if you want to win tickets we got to do the drawing here in a couple of weeks if you want to win tickets to bonnaroo kind of sold out tickets to bonnaroo that's right wait the tickets are sold out no we're not we're giving away tickets to a sold out bonnaroo there you go uh there with a go. camping pass just hashtag the what podcast on instagram or twitter and um you know we'll pick a uh, we'll pick somebody at random here in probably what 10 days two weeks or so right yeah we got to give them enough time to to get packed i think it's like 90 days oh god depending on when you're here this i know oh, man I know. I I don't. I'm. I'm not. I'm not ready. Well, think about this. Say, think ready. about this. We're recording this in early June. Um, it would when, be Bonnaroo right when now. When this comes out, it would be Bonnaroo. We would be yeah. on the farm. You know, um, circling back on some news that happened, you know, in the last couple of days. I think that I want to. I want to. You called back to a message on in uh, on Facebook earlier in the show about a guy who who took me to task about Deftones. I want someone to take me to task on liking that ACL lineup. Uh, I should be beaten in the street for liking that ACL lineup as much as I do because it stinks. <laughs> it 
stinks. <laughs> I don't know what I was seeing. Who so when you? Oh, the day-to-day got hold of me. I saw the day-to-day breakdown of the ACL lineup, and it is terrible. Oh, thinned it out? Yes. When okay. you see it, especially when you, when you just do week-to-week, because so many bands are only doing week one and so many are doing week two. You see, there was a day I might have counted two artists that I would I, see. You know, we talked about, I talked about that. That The whole two weekend thing to me is confusing. I don't, yeah, that would, that's, that, what you're talking about is what I was alluding to could happen that would ruin it for me. You know, is if I lived there and it didn't matter, great. But if if you're I'm there, driving, which, yeah, it's what which you do. You're gonna pit? Yeah, if you're already there. <laughs> you're you there. Might as well go. <laughs> But if you had to choose between the two weekends, that makes, yeah, then it becomes not so good. So I, I, uh, I think that there's look, even though we've seen how many lineups come and go, how many Bonnaroo's come and go, you know, I'm still a fan and I still get, uh, I still get the, the, the wobbly legs when I see something I really like, you know, if I see like Barry did the, the lineup in 2019 might've been, or 2020 might've been terrible, but Barry saw Miley Cyrus and his <laughs> legs got wobbly and it didn't matter what the rest of the lineup was for him. It was the best lineup he'd ever seen. Uh, it was when, I, lineup, but... when I saw George Strait, my legs got wobbly and you know, my perspective got a little flawed. It was the lineup is terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'll have to look at the day. Let me ask you this. This was a conversation we had at dinner in Austin when I went to see the Black Pumas. Is is Erica Badu a headliner? You asked that the other day. You said yes. At the time, no, I said no, but then you asked, you compared her to another, and I said yes. So is Stevie Nicks a headliner? You know, it's funny because she's going to be down in uh, what, Shaky Knees, right? Shaky Knees. Um, To me, she is if you're going to go legacy act for sure. And it came up on some social media for a couple of people like, my God, who, you know what? And the first thing my daughter said is I would go just to see Stevie Nicks. That's that's what every 30 to 45 year old woman's going to say. So, you know, that's why I said last show, I don't get caught up in it nearly as much as you do because I get it that it's, you know, where the audience is. Well, yeah, if it's, as I've said, if they have your pe- favorite person on there, it's the buying up less lineup ever. Yeah. If yeah. they're not, it's the worst. So you think, I mean, I don't Rufus to soul. Is that a headliner? I, I don't have opinion one way or the other. The answer is no. Yeah. No. So no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it is a big no. Yeah. Um, it, it is. And that would be fine. Uh, look, I don't need headliners to make a festival go round. but when I look at the rest of the lineup, it just doesn't do anything. Yeah. There is nothing interest now again i do like the the fact that they did the tanya tucker kind of stuff that kind of i love that but then you get to a lineup that is hot trash from the moment you see it (laughs) and god love them i hate to say this because they're fine people but man the music midtown lineup might be one of the worst things i've ever seen in my life it is a absolute pop culture trying too hard train wreck they are trying so hard to make that look i don't know if it is it is like you asked a couple of weeks back just who you get and yep. what you're stuck with thank you that's what i was getting maybe maybe that's it but this feels we, purposeful this, i think music come, mid- uh late late fall maybe november maybe october after they, it's sort of shaken out maybe we have ali and john back on and even Troy and whoever else you can think of and just say, how did it go? You know, was this a case of uh, oversaturation? And because as we predicted months and months ago, October and September, September, October, we're going to be packed and there's only so much to go around. Mm-hmm. So I, I well, Miley's know, I gone. She's getting it. past. Miley's getting on every festival every lineup in the country. Or... Yeah. Which by the way, and that's, you know, I meant to, to bring this up. I almost feel as though Miley has become outcast 2.0. There was, I, I cannot remember when we had that conversation with the guys at Book Bonnaroo. They did, or did I, but did I or did I not ask them about outcast and the fact that outcast played every festival that year on their, on their last tour ever, except Bonnaroo. 
I don't remember if I asked them that question, but there was a, there's got to be something about Outcast not playing Bonnaroo, yeah. the one festival that they didn't play. Something tells me that's the reason why Bonnaroo didn't want them because they were playing everywhere else and it would sort of water down their product. Maybe Bonnaroo had Miley Cyrus last year, knowing that she was going to try and do a festival run the next year and didn't want to be a part of it and wanted them for, wanted her first. Yeah, or maybe, maybe they, they got up. her and she was that sort of George Strait, like you, you know, you got your knees wobbly and then everybody wanted her. I don't know. That it, It's an interesting question how that who who gets what and why and how they go to this one and not that one and because if you if you follow any of the bonnaroo conversation right now the biggest question is why miley that's why i say i think probably the time to ask is after it's all settled out and just see how it goes maybe um but it, it i don't know i mean we've talked with Brian and Steven at Bonnaroo about how they put a festival together and it's all about the lanes and all that. Yeah. I don't know if that, that matters this year. That's I don't, my I, point. Yeah, yeah. You can say that and you can intend to do that, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, unless you are the 800 pound gorilla, you're not picking and choosing everybody you want. Things have to mm -hmm. line up. And, and uh, so I don't know. That's, that's what I mean. Like, I think we talked with them they were they are the big enough a gorilla that they could start with top of the line and then create the lanes sure they may not get everybody they want in that lane mm -hmm. but they get the top of the line and then they create whereas a lot of other festivals they gotta sp uh, spray That's actually, it, splatter that, shot it that just actually made me think about something we didn't ask them you know, if if they start from the top down or the bottom up, if they started from the top down and they, you know, had Post Malone, Lady Gaga, you know, uh, throw throw another one in Flaming Lips. If those and then you start to create everything down downward, right? Mm -hmm. Creating a lane for the Lady Gaga fan, creating a, an urban lane for the Post Malone, urban pop lane for the for the uh, Post Malone fan. And then you found a rock lane for the Flaming Lips. If they lose one of their top lines, do they fill that spot in with somebody similar because they have already created a lane for that person or they just try and get the best headliner they can get? I, we ne never asked phone. that before. <laughs> yeah, they get the guy who answers the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, if, if Flaming Lips drops out, do, you know, they go to Government Mule. Um, uh, or, you know, some other, you know, right, right. If, if Lady Gaga drops out, do they go to pink? You know, right. do they try and figure out how, or, and or they, if, or if flaming lips drop out, do they get pink and have Lady Gaga and pink? Right. That's your question. Yeah. Right. I don't remember if we asked that specifically or not. I think we kind of tried to. Um, something tells they me they, something tells me they wouldn't do it that way. I mean, I just, so, something tells me they would, they would try and, they would try and find something that fit something the 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 plan well, that they had already put together yeah well the other sort of question and i do know this has happened at other festivals let's say it's uh pink or erica baidu and you have erica baidu and flaming lips and and post malone but then um flaming lips drop out but lady gaga is, is available do you not take lady gaga because you've already got pink or erica baidu you know you take yeah you say yeah i mean if the if the money works yeah, you if the money works, something tells me the money wouldn't work. But um, yeah, if I mean, I just don't think that you have a spare two mil sitting around. Yeah, but you, you know? also don't say, "Well, we'll get you next time." You know, you, you take it. You, yeah, you, you, you don't you don't punt on um, right. exactly. when when in, when Prince is available. Exactly. Yeah, we'll see you next year. Yeah, call us back. Yeah. So um, so next week, uh, how to make a hit part two on the uh, what podcast? Uh, anything else to get to uh, other than? Check out Midist on uh, Spotify and uh, and Bandcamp. Check out Repeat Repeat, the theme song, which, by the way, they uh, they sent me their their new single that comes out. Oh, I forgot when it comes out, but oh, Barry, they've got a hit. Nice. They've got a hit. I'm saying this as as radio guy. Um, I'm not just as a friend. This is a hit. I love it. And so if it's not a hit, come back to how to make a hit. <laughs> and dissect what went wrong because yeah, this yeah. is exactly what I'm actually it's a great parallel because they've got a song and I think it's a major hit but based on what Mike said and what will Troy say 
those fundamentals have got to all be working in the same jet stream or else you're going to things are going to cross and it's just never going to work. This song is a hit and hopefully um, you'll hear it soon enough. I, I, I feel like they're releasing it next week. I could be wrong. If not, I'll find out and we'll uh, we'll retweet it at the what podcast on uh, on Twitter. Is it at the what? Po- I always get this wrong. Is it at the what underscore podcast i can yep. never remember our, our twitter, twitter handle yeah, it's underscores after oh. the what yeah send us a note so you can win some tickets yeah do it yep. hashtag the what podcast on twitter i'm brad that's barry we'll talk to you next week on the what podcast Love you. Consequence Podcast Network.